you're turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we are studying through uh, a, a letter. I like to always remind ourselves it's an actual historical letter, a historical document written by an actual person, Paul, who became Apostle Paul, to a new church plant that he planted in Thessalonians. I know some of these church plant groups out there think they've got the hottest new thing, but it kind of started in Acts, the church planting movement. And so uh, Paul went all over the place, and he started these church plants, and then he left, and he would go around and start some others. He'd come back and visit, and he would write letters. So this is a letter to a church in Thessalonica. But since we are a church plant, we were planted in 1999. Myself and Tamara, a few of us, we planted this church in 1999. We're a church plant. So when he writes a letter to the church in Thessalonica, we say he's writing it to us. And we are, we're studying today from 1 Chapelonians. 1 Chapelonians chapter now, as I mentioned uh, last Sunday, we're in a series. It's called Faithful. As I read through this a book, I, I kept seeing how we could be faithful in all these different ways and how we should do, desire to be faithful. And today's title is Faithful Relationships. Faithful Relationships. Now, I mentioned this last week. Paul has this tendency of um, he writes a letter, and you can see it in some of his other letters, and somewhere in the middle of the what we call the book, it looks like the letter ends. He gives like a goodbye. And then he has about one or two more chapters of things he wants to throw in before he says goodbye. It reminds me of uh, you teenagers when you have, you, you know, you're going to the prom and all these weeks and months before you're getting everything ready for the prom and getting your dress and your skin your suit and your parents have kind of talked to you maybe it's your first prom you've ever gone to and uh, you get to the prom night and you're about to head out the door and here you go and they say oh remember and there's about 30 more minutes of those last things now remember now remember now remember that's kind of like what it reminds me that paul does in some of his letters he like ends the conversation and then he says finally and we get about two more chapters so we've got a couple more chapters of kind of the p.s of uh, First Chapelonians. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. For you remember what we taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Well, as I do every week, how I prepare my messages is uh, I just open up. It's Monday or so in the beginning of the week. I just open up, and I don't have to search around where am I preaching next because I know it's the next passage. So I just open up and look at the next passage, and I read it, and I pray, and usually something jumps out at me. And I know that's what the Holy Spirit wants me to talk about. And so what jumped out at me right away was this phrase, live in a way that pleases God. And it seems basic. It seems like something you would just read right past, but the Holy Spirit just kind of highlighted it with his highlighter. So it jumped out at me. Live in a way that pleases God. We would all love to say, and if I asked you, you'd probably say it and I would say it, we would love to say that that is exactly how we live. That as Chapelonians, we, we, we live to please God. God, but there's one thing we do in our church. We've done it from the very beginning. We're just brutally honest with ourselves. We don't try to pretend we're some kind of special Christians. or We're just honest with ourselves. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to be very honest with ourselves. Do we really live to please God? Uh, every human being, even those precious babies, I'm watching some of y'all with your babies. I follow you on Instagram, and I see all that stuff you're doing. I love it. And my, Instagram, my Instagram's got a lot of babies. I feel like a grandparent. I'm not a grandparent yet, but my Instagram is just filled with y'all posting stuff with your babies, and I love it. But those babies, even those babies and every human being, were born with a sinful nature. And we're born with this sinful nature that tends to be, and here's kind of the first phrase, we tend to be self focused, self-focused, if you're taking notes, write that down, self-focused, and that means this, I'll put it on the screen, I live to please me. Now some of us, we just, we have that in us, we all do. We all have this self-focused, I live to please me in us. It's there. And if I have to choose three people, I have three people that I'm going to please, I'm going to please me, 
myself and I. Some of you knew that was coming. My three favorite people. And I'm going to make sure that those three people are always pleased. That's a natural tendency in us from our sinful nature. But a self-focused person, what that means if you're self-focused, it's different than being selfish. A self-focused person makes sure that you always have the focus on yourself. And you may not even realize it. And some of you today, you, the Holy Spirit might show you and convict you that maybe you tend to be this way. Because you may not even know it. But a self-focused person makes sure every conversation ends up being that person's story. Don't point at anybody. I see some of you looking already. Some of you. That person in a conversation... You may be telling your story, and before you know it, it's their story. And every situation, every decision, every situation kind of ends up being focused on what you want it to be, how you want it to go. That is a self-focused person. You're, 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 you're not comfortable with other people making decisions based on anything, unless, of course, they make the decision you would have made in the first place. Then you're happy to say, oh, okay, that's fine. But you wanted to make the decision. You may not even be a selfish person. I, I heard this last night. Let's see if I can remember how it goes. I, I put it on my phone. I'm going to see if I remember this. So I heard this last night watching a television show. You get inspiration from different places, right? So let me see if I can remember how it goes. Uh, if you do good for selfish reasons, it doesn't mean you are good. It just means you are good at being selfish. If you're doing good, because you may even t you're doing something good, and you're, well, how could I be selfish? I'm not selfish. Look at the good I'm doing. But if you're doing good for selfish reasons, it doesn't mean you're good. It just means you're good at being selfish. Maybe you're not a selfish person. Maybe this, maybe when it comes to Thanksgiving dinner, you're going to let someone else have that last piece of pumpkin pie. But in reality, you don't even like pumpkin pie. So they say, can I have it? Oh, sure. I'm, going to, I'm not going to be selfish. You have it. And then you go on and tell them five reasons why you don't like pumpkin pie and why you're on a diet, and it's all about you again. So it's not really selfish. It's just someone who tends to be self focused, you're always, and maybe it's a fear thing because you always have to be in control in one way or another. And you feel like you're out of control. And so you're self-focused. And that's reinforced in the world. The world's going to tell you nobody else is looking out for number one. Nobody else is looking out for you. You have to look out for yourself. If you see something, you need to take it because nobody else is going to give it for you, give it to you. And so we're reinforced this self-focused mindset. Maybe that maybe that's you, but maybe that doesn't describe you at all. Maybe you would say that's not me. I don't live to please me. Here's how I live. I'll put it on the screen. I live to please others. The first phrase is I live to please me. Second phrase, I live to please others. But perhaps it is not in a healthy way. Perhaps there is an unmet need inside of yourself. Perhaps there's a hurt, something inside of yourself that you just have to be a people pleaser. And you're always letting others have their way and you're always pleasing others, living to please others. But it's coming from not a self-focused, but a self-denial. And you're living in a self-denial type of life. It might be from past events, some trauma in your life. There are people who go through trauma events who end up being people pleasers. And they do it to the detriment of themselves. And maybe you don't see it today. Maybe the Holy Spirit's going to show you that that's you. Because maybe you don't, you don't even see that happening. Maybe you're even convincing yourself that you're doing it all for God. I just want everyone else to be blessed. But you're doing it to a point to where you're neglecting yourself. You don't have the ability to say no to anybody or anything, even when you should. And you don't have healthy boundaries. I, we, we are a big believer in that book. There is no book like the Bible, all right? No book like the Bible. And I'm a big believer in the book called Boundaries. 
written by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. And you all know, if you've been in this church, we've taught through it several times. It's one of our main books that we teach in small groups. It's a Christian-based, uh, mental health-based book that uses Scripture that teaches you how to have healthy boundaries in your life. And people who are others-focused or in self-denial and deny themselves, they don't have healthy boundaries, and you're always out of control. You're neglecting your own spiritual needs. You're neglecting your own emotional needs and your own physical needs, and it feels good, but it's possibly a codependent relationship and maybe one codependent relationship after another, and you just end up being emotionally exhausted. You think you're going to find peace pleasing others, but it's really just self-denial. Some people live self-focused. I live to please me. Some people live uh, self-denial. I live to please others. It's good and healthy. I'm going to give you another word, to be self-aware. It's good and spiritually and biblically healthy to be self-aware. Self-aware is, is not being arrogant. It's being honest. Self-aware is knowing who I am and knowing who God is, knowing more about me, knowing more about God. We try to do this every Sunday. We're a church that our, our, our messages sometimes are very they're doctrinal, theological, but sometimes they're counseling. We try to do it every Sunday. We open up the Word and we say, Holy Spirit, look inside my heart and mind. Help me to know myself more. Show me where I'm wrong. Show me where I'm too much in, in, in self-focused. Show me where I'm too much in self-denial. Help me be self-aware so I know who I am. Help me know more about my sinful, selfish nature so I can, I can put it down. Help me know more about your nature, Holy Spirit, that's inside of me so I can exalt that more in myself. Help me, Lord. Now, the Bible teaches us, because I, I know if you're old school, you've heard, the, you've heard the sermons about denying self. The Bible teaches you to deny yourself. The Bible teaches you to die to self. But I would argue that it's talking about dying to your sinful, selfish nature. It's not talking about self. It's talking about your selfish, sinful nature. The Bible wants you to love yourself. I don't know if you've ever heard that from the pulpit before. But the Bible says that you need to love yourself. We know that the Bible wants us to love neighbors and love enemies, right? So we know, we know what that means. To love my neighbor, to love my enemy means to do good and to take care of them and to bless them. But the Bible wants you to do that to yourself as well. And in case you think that's just a New Testament teaching, here it is in Leviticus 19, 33 and 34. Look at this. Do not take advantage of foreigners who live among you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites, and here it is, and love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So even in the Old Testament, it's saying to love others as you love yourself. It tells us this in Galatians 5.14, for the whole law, and we know Jesus said this, in Galatians Paul repeats it, the whole law can be summed up in one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And there is a healthy, biblical, self-aware, self-love that we need to be focused on. Not in an arrogant way, not in a denial way, just knowing who I am. I heard a definition of humility one time, because I, I, it was, it, I, that was something I, that God had to teach me through my teen years. Humility and what, what was too much humility and what was not, and Humility is not always denying yourself. That's what we think it is sometimes. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. That's probably an unhealthy self-denial. Humility is knowing my strengths, knowing my weaknesses, and being aware, equally aware of both and not denying either one. Humility is knowing who God is and knowing who I am and not getting the two confused. Humility says, I know myself more. Parents, this is one thing we are so, it's so important we do this. We're not trying to raise another us. This is a unique human being. I've only, I only have one child, and he's got kind of both me and Tamara all mixed in there together. Some of you, you've got several children, and they're all different, aren't they? <laughs> These are unique individuals, and the goal is not to make another us, 
The goal is to help them be them. The goal is to help them become self-aware. And as they get into those teen years, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get them more aware of who they are in Christ. What are their strengths? What are their abilities? What are the things they like? What do they want to be? We're building that up in them. The safe place. Home has to be a safe place where our teens can get to know themselves with guidance I don't believe in, look, I don't believe in that whole, well, they're 12, they've got to figure it out on their own now. They're 12! No, they don't figure it out on their own. I'm sorry, teenagers, but yet you, you, you're not there yet. And your parents do have to guide you. Proverbs 22, 6 tells us, direct your children. We are to direct them onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. I've got to make sure I know what the right path is and then I need to direct them on it. But as we're doing that, we also need to give them freedom to become who they are. And they may think different than you. I remember telling Andrew, Tim and I did this with Andrew, you know, as he got into his teen years. Uh, as you go into your life, you know, we pray that you know the Lord and you're serving the Lord, which he is. But we told him, we said, but you may feel differently about things than we do. I don't need you to be another me. I already got a me. I just want you to be you. And there may be some things where we aren't the same. Maybe even when it comes to doctrine, maybe we will disagree. That doesn't freak me out. We need to let them develop into who they are, directing them onto the right path. Here's one of the things, parents, we have to do. I encourage you, parents, know your children well. Know your children. Know your spouse more than anybody else on earth, but know your kids Get to know your kids. How many of you watch The Crown? Any of you watching The Crown on Netflix? You know, some of you watch The Crown. And you know, the royal family and all that, and what a, what a dysfunctional family that is. Uh, <coughs> but you know, one of the recent episodes, it's like the queen is going to call in her, all her children one by one to have a meeting with them, and she makes sure that her assistant has a meeting with her before the kids come, so he will tell her what they like and who they are, because she doesn't know them really. You have to know your kids. Here's one way. To, one of the best ways to know your kids is not to talk at them, but to listen to them. Listen to them. Listen to what they think. Listen to who they are. Have conversations where half the time they're talking and you're listening to them. Get to know your kids because they need to become self-aware through these teen years. The Holy Spirit's going to help you. The Holy Spirit has a unique blueprint for every human being, and he is going to help us. As I listen to the Holy Spirit, you're going to discover yourself. Now, some of you, if you're old like me, I'm starting to get where I can say I'm old, okay? So if you're old like me, I hope you're never, don't stop discovering about yourself. You're not done. I don't care what age you are, you're not done. I'm still learning things about myself, and I think that's cool. I, I, don't, I don't ever want to go back to, I've never gone to high school reunion or college reunion. I'm not that person. You know, you go back to the high school reunion, you go back to your high school reunions and you meet so-and-so and they have not changed since high school, emotionally, mentally, and any way. That's not a good thing. We all should be changing. I'm still learning about myself. I, no matter how old you are, keep discovering. Holy Spirit, show me something new. Maybe there's some new talent or hobby or ability that you've never tried before. Man, don't ever stop becoming more self-aware. The more I know God, don't ever stop knowing God. My mom was the greatest example of that. She died when she was 70 years old, too young. But she, at 68, 69, she was like, I don't know enough about God. I don't know enough about God. I need to learn more about God. Never stop learning about God. Never stop letting the Spirit learn about yourself. And the more you are God-aware and the more you are self-aware, the more healthy you're going to be. And you won't be self-focused, living to please me. You won't be so others-focused that you're just living to please others. You'll be able to say what Paul says here to the Thessalonians. You live to please God. That's my goal. I live to please God. Not myself, not others. Now, as I live to please God, he will bless me. As I live to please God, others will be blessed. But my focus is I live to please God. So part one of this message is maybe, maybe 
Maybe you are a little too self-focused, and please just be honest with yourself. What's the point of coming to church? Just be honest with yourself. Let the Holy Spirit talk to you. And maybe you can leave here with a prayer saying, Holy Spirit, help me this week to be less self-focused. Maybe you're living too much in self-denial and you're letting other people take advantage of you too much. Because I'm just helping others. Maybe you need to be a little stronger. So maybe the Holy Spirit says you need to speak up a little more for yourself. Maybe you haven't really been pleasing God and today you want to live saying, I want to please God. Now Paul gets very specific in the next portion, in one way that we can please God, and that's the, in the area of sexual relationships in our life. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. God's will, he goes right on writing, God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passions like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife, for the Lord avenges all such sins, as we have solemnly warned you before. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now before I get into this, just know that if any of this, if you're, if you're living in a way that doesn't fit this scripture, please don't feel judged or condemned by us at all. Everybody has a different path right now and people live in different lives and all I want to do today is just kind of talk about biblically how does this area of sexual relations, how is it supposed to work in our lives? And so from this point on, we can try to make some choices, but don't feel condemned about what's happening in the past because there's mercy and grace and forgiveness. God created us. It was his choice to create us as sexual beings. He could have had a totally different way to do it. He chose to make us male and female. He chose to make us in a way that we would have sexual relationships. I just think it's important for, for Christian children and teens, as soon as you have this conversation with them, it's important for them to know that Satan didn't create sexuality. Because we tend to in the church just, you know, almost you know, treat it like, oh, don't talk about that. But it's something that God created for us. Satan didn't create it. He uses it to mess us up. But this is something that God created. Having sexual relations is not a sin. It only is a sin if we do not follow God's guidelines. And God's guidelines are one man and one woman in marriage. That's something that you've probably heard in church. Let's talk about it. One man, one woman and marriage. Can I just say, I'm not going to focus today on alternative sexual lifestyles because we in the church spend so much time uh, calling everybody else a sinner without doing business in our own home. Uh, any, any, kind, any kind of sexual relationship outside of marriage is the same sin. And we might think these sins are worse, but any sexual relationship outside of marriage is extramarital relations, sexual relations. And however that works out in their life, it's the same thing, extramarital relations. So I want us to focus on just God, one man, one woman, in a, a married relationship, having sexual relations. Even if you think this through logically. So let's just start logically, okay? Let's start with human reasoning. If, just think of a world where every young man stays sexually pure until marriage and every young woman stays sexually pure until marriage. And just think of the, the, the things that happen, the things that wouldn't happen. I mean, it's just a genetic, biological thing that you wouldn't have sexual diseases. You wouldn't have sexually transmitted diseases because nobody would be out there catching it with anybody. You wouldn't have 
unwanted pregnancies outside of marriage. Now, you all know, we, we go through this, and it happens, people in our church that end up be, being pregnant outside of marriage, and we love them just the same, and we love those babies just the same. We don't treat anybody different in this place. Everybody gets treated the same, grace, love, and mercy. But if it was one woman and one man, pure and pure, and then marriage, and then they started having sex, you would always have a baby being born in a, a marriage relationship that had chosen to be together for life. A lot of things. How about this? And some of you, you, you know a lot of you, you've gone through this. Just the emotional pain that comes when you are that intimate with somebody in a relationship that's not in marital bounds and it's just break up and then you get with another person and you're that intimate and break up and the emotional and mental pain that comes with those relationships. It wouldn't be there. I know I'm describing an ideal world. But in the ideal world, even, even with human reasoning and human logic, this makes sense. God's ways actually makes sense. It makes sense biologically. It makes sense medically. It makes sense sociological and sociological ways. It just makes sense. But I love what Paul does here. Because he says it's not about human teaching. Approaching this topic with human logic or human reasoning or just human teaching will not cut it. And parents, we have got to make sure we give our teenagers a higher reason than that. We need to give them a higher reason than just, well, you know, it makes sense logically. We need to give them a higher reason, and Paul does it right here. It's God's will. It's God's will for us to be holy, and I'm sorry if this hurts, but he says we're rejecting God. So when you actually enter into an extramarital sexual relationship, you are rejecting God. You're not just, because sometimes, y'all, this is what has always bothered me about church. I remember growing up in church, and, you know, there were, there were a few sins that were going to send you to hell. One of them was smoking cigarettes. I don't know what happened with that one. That was weird, but, yeah, it was kind of like, well, you may not be going to hell, but you're sure smelling like it. What was that? You know, we used to say stuff like that. We just were not nice. It, Cruel. Yeah, that was ridiculous. But you, it, it, if there was anything ever said about sexuality, it was usually just talking about homosexuality. And yet, I was in youth group. I knew my friends in youth group that were sleeping around. And they weren't doing it in homosexual relationships. They were doing it in heterosexual relationships. But nobody ever said anything about that. And I always thought to myself, yeah, but isn't that just as wrong? We've got to make sure our teenagers and our young adults and our singles know it's not just an acceptable sin in church. It's, it's really not, because God is saying it's against God's will, and when we enter into that kind of relationship, we are rejecting God. Now, I'm all for the human efforts. True love waits. We did the true love waits thing in church for a while. I'm all for teaching abstinence. So I'm all, I, I don't have a problem at all with the human efforts and the human teaching, but that's not what I'm going to do today because I want to give you an, an, a higher reason to stay away from sexual relationships outside of marriage, and that's just your love for God. That's just who He is and all He has done for you, and you don't want to reject Him. You don't want to be in rebellious, rebellious against Him. It's a major battle, y'all. There's a lot of pressure there's a lot of pressure on our teenagers. There's a lot of pressure on our young adults. Look, y'all, there's a lot of pressure on our married, marriage relationships. There's a lot of pressure to, to move outside of God's will in this life. A lot of outside influences. Christians, you don't get saved and all of a sudden lose this temptation. You, you don't. You, it, it doesn't matter if you're a pastor. It doesn't matter who you are. You're still going to have this temptation in your life. It's a battle for everybody. Our teens in Brave, our Brave Youth Group, we, we have, I don't know if you all know this, but it's been proven that we have the absolute best teens in the whole area. It's actually, I think I saw it on, um, on Facebook, so it's got to be true. Somebody posted that. And we have the best teens, so it's true. 
but even our teens are going to fight this battle. Your wonderful children are going to fight this battle, and we need to be clear. There is a higher reason to abstain than just, oh, well, you don't want to get pregnant. There's a higher reason to abstain than, oh, well, wait till you find the right one. How many times do they think they're going to find the right one? Five? There's a higher reason to abstain, and that is just God. Is God. He loves you so much, and he created you in a way that you would be willing to wait for that one person. It's beyond human reason. Now, I want to tie all that in with the first part of the message. We talked about being self-focused. And there are those who enter into self-focused sexual relationships. Because if you're just honest, some people think it's just it's what I want. It's what I want. I'm not going to deny myself. I'm going to give myself that pleasure. I'm not going to wait. Whatever reason, if you just if it's because you need to fit in, it's because you need to be popular. You just want to do it, and you're going to do it. You're going to be in control. So you're going to enter into a self-focused sexual relationship because it's really all about you. Others engage in self-denial sexual relationships. It's really not about them. It's about the other person. And you hear this sometimes. Well, but if I don't, then they won't love me. If I don't, then they're going to leave me and date somebody else. I have to do this. It's like maybe you don't even really want to do it, but you feel like you have to because the other person is telling you how much they have to have it or not telling you what's really true. And so you are in a self-denial sexual relationship. Well, you're here today. You came to this church. You're watching the video. So I'm guessing that you want at least something of God in your life. You want to have, you have an interest in God's point of view And we're just telling you from this passage that if you enter into any kind of sexual relationship outside of what God has planned for you, it is not his will for your life, and it is actually rejecting God. Now, please hear this. This is so important. After I did all that, don't miss this part. God will still love you. If you have fallen into that temptation, If you fall into that temptation again, God will still love you. He loves you more than that. God will always be there for you. God gives you grace. I know I'm saying that if you do that, you are rejecting God. I don't mean that in a salvation way. You're not losing your salvation. But you're rejecting what is best for you. But can I tell you this? God will not reject you. We've spent too much time, church. Can I just throw this out there? We've spent too many years shaming people in their sexual sin and not shaming people for their prejudice or their pride or their greed or their hatred. And it's not right. We've acted like if someone sins sexually... I don't know how many times, y'all. I mean, I've been in ministry my whole life, my whole adult life. I've been, that's all I've ever done is church work. And I can't tell you the times that someone, and guys, you know, I don't know if you realize this, guys, but you don't ever have to worry about showing up to church pregnant. And I've just seen women sometimes who, they fall into what God didn't want for them and what was not best for them. And they end up being pregnant and they don't want to come to church. And I've had phone calls with them through the years and I've said, look, you come to church (laughs) because I love you and we're going to love you and we're going to love that baby. And you're sitting there and maybe you think people are judging you, but you know what? They got issues in their life too, so don't worry about them, you know? (laughs) We're going to love people. So we need to be sure, church, we don't shame people. We love people. 
God will love you. God will not reject you. And I promise you, I will always love you. And I will never reject you. Tamara will love you. And Tamara will never reject you. Sometimes there are consequences. But you'll never lose our, our love. We are a truth and grace church. And I hope you're hearing that today. We're not ashamed to say the truth. But we're going to do it with grace. So we're going to have truth and grace mixed together. But it's biblically clear here. God's will is for us to stay away, and he says, all sexual sin. I'm not going to give you a list today. But I think we can think of different ways where there is sexual sin beyond even just having physical relationships with another person. We have to make sure we stay away from all sexual sin. It's right there in the world. So here's the goal. So especially those that aren't married today, I'm going to give you what I've said. I've said this many years in the past. I'm going to give you my advice. I believe that a relationship needs to start spiritual and then move to emotional and then move to the physical. I believe that a biblical relationship starts first and foremost with a spiritual connection. Now, I'm not in denial I know when you look across the, cl the classroom, the first thing you notice about that guy isn't his spiritualness. I get it. I understand that. You look across the room and there's that girl and you don't go, man, she is so spiritual. You don't even know her. What I'm saying is you don't enter into a relationship until you know where they are spiritually. It has to start with a spiritual connection. In other words, you know where they stand spiritually. And it doesn't mean when they say to you, oh, I'm a Christian. It needs to be a little more than that. You need to have deeper discussions than that. What do you mean by that? Who is Jesus? My mom, my mom did this. So my mom, you know, way back. Mom and dad are gone now. But when dad wanted to date, mom said, well, our first date is going to be at, on William Howard Taft Road, on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, the place is called First Christian Assembly of God. That's where we will meet. You guys have been there. I see you over here. You've been to that church. Look at that. Somebody that's here that's been to FCA. Wow. <laughs> that's awesome. That might be a good place to start dating. Come to my church. You need to make sure your parents are involved as well. But a spiritual connection. Do you believe the same about God? Do you believe the same about Jesus Christ? Do you have the same spiritual goals in life to get to know God more, to get to know each other more? I'm sorry, but it's got to start there. I know that seems silly, especially for those, those first dates in high school. That seems kind of ridiculous. But once you fall in love, it's all over. If you don't start with a spiritual connection, by the time you're talking to me about the issues in your life, you're too much in love. And I've told you before, when someone's in love and they come to have pastoral counseling, I just sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. I'm just wah, 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 wah. No one's hearing the word I say. All I see is the little twinkles in their eyes. And I go, they're not listening. So make sure there's a spiritual connection. Before you enter into a relationship, now I, your parents can control your dating routine. If there's things called dating that's not entering into a relationship, I'll leave that up to parents. But before you get into a relationship, a spiritual connection has to be made. Next is the emotional connection. That is, do you like being with each other, just talking? Do you like to do things together? Do you actually laugh together? Can you have conversations? Is that person your friend? So after a strong spiritual connection, you're making a strong emotional connection. This is somebody I really like to be with. I don't believe in the marriages where you don't really like each other. You're married, but she has her friends and he has his friends, but you all aren't friends. So it has to be a strong emotional connection. And then you go into the physical connections. I know this isn't how the world does it. Spiritual connection, emotional connection, and physical connection. Now, let me put this in a way. This is the way I like to put it to young people dating, thinking about marriage. On your wedding night, wouldn't it be amazing? Can you just think, I know this sounds Disney-ish, but it's really biblical. Think about this. On your wedding night, you guys have been dating. You have a strong spiritual connection. 
You have a strong emotional connection, but you have waited, and now here's what happens on the wedding night. You have the ultimate physical expression of a deep spiritual and emotional connection. Doesn't that sound romantic? Look, all the ladies just went, oh. See, I know. Doesn't that sound romantic? The ultimate physical expression of a deep spiritual and emotional connection. That's your goal, guys. That's your goals, ladies. That's where we're trying to head. So in this specific area of sexuality, we don't live to please ourselves. We don't live to please others. In this area of sexuality, I live to please God. And then I take that outside of all of the areas of life, beyond that specific area. So expand it to every area of my life. I don't live to please self. I don't live to please others. I live to please God. I'm not going to be self-focused. I'm not going to live in self-denial. I'm going to be God-aware. I'm going to be self-aware. And what that will lead to in all areas of your life is faithful relationships. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for this word. I pray you to help us in this very practical area, Lord. Lord, I pray for those going through temptations. Lord, give them strength. It is so hard. Give them strength, God. I pray for our young men and women. I pray for singles of all ages. I pray for marriages, God, where there's so much temptation in this area. Help us, God. Help us to stay pure in your eyes, God. Help us to stay pure for you. God, human reasoning is awesome, but God, we want to do it because of our love for you, because of who you are in our lives. We live to please you. God, I pray for those who maybe are feeling condemnation or conviction because this is an area where they, they have made mistakes. God, I pray today they would feel your love and your grace and your mercy. And that, God, they would feel the love of this church. Thank you, God. You want to receive Jesus Christ today. I said, what a message for you to receive Jesus. But this is, you come to God. None of this works unless you come to God through Jesus Christ. Uh, you cannot live a Christian life without knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. It just doesn't work. It's, not a, it's just not a, 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 a principle to live by. It's a person that we worship. And so you come to God through Jesus Christ. We're going to have a prayer. It's going to be on the screen. Nothing magical about the words. But when you pray this prayer, it means that you believe everything the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ and you're accepting him as your Lord and Savior. You pray this prayer. You can repeat it after me. You can pray it in your heart. But mean every word in your heart. Today, you will be saved. Just pray this with me. God, I believe in you. I believe you are real, and I believe you love me. I believe in Jesus, that he is God the Son. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross for my sins, and he rose from the dead. I don't understand it all, but in faith today, I choose to believe. I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior and my Lord. God, forgive me of all my sin. I'm sorry for the things I have done. Holy Spirit, live in me. Lead me and guide me all the days of my life. Thank you, God, for my salvation. In Jesus' name.